Hey there, I'm Ariana Parks, physical therapist, and today I interview Dr. Stephen May, and he is going to talk about the science behind the centralization phenomena of spinal symptoms. Dr. May is a PT with over 30 years of experience, and he has written textbooks with Robbie McKenzie detailing mechanical diagnosis and therapy in the extremities, cervical, and lumbar spine, and has over 100 publications. In our discussion today, you are going to learn about centralization and directional preference and what research says about it, centralization as a prognostic sign and management strategy, and centralization in acute, subacute, and chronic back and neck pain, and much more. So if you feel this information is valuable, please consider subscribing to our channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up, and share with other clinicians you feel my benefit from this conversation. I hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the Do Anything, Anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Balance is the essence of movement, and movement is the essence of life. This week's episode is brought to you by Fitter First, creator of the ProFitter, the original 3D cross trainer that started the functional fitness revolution in 1985. Its timeless design is loved by PTs and trainers for balance and strength of the upper, core, and lower body. Find it in other great Fitter First products like wobble, rocker, and soft boards, as well as slant boards and the new FitFoot at fitter1.com. That's F-I-T-T-E-R, numeral1.com. Hi, Dr. May. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And let's start talking a little bit about your background for the ones that don't know you. Just tell us a little bit about your career. Certainly. Um, I trained as a physiotherapist in the UK in the 1980s. I uh, qualified in 1990, and I uh, was in clinical practice in primary care in the UK. That means working in uh, GP practices. Uh, and I undertook various courses in the early 1990s. They included the McKenzie courses. Uh, I, um, for those who know the McKenzie uh, education program, I did the diploma in 1995. Um, I, so I carried on then working. Uh, I didn't complete any more clinical courses after that. I thought I'd have my fill of clinical courses. Um, I became more interested in research methodology. I did a master's in research methodology uh, in the UK, Sheffield University, which was very good. Uh, introduction to uh, research methods. So very non-clinical, but that got my got my interest going in uh, the methods of different methods of researching different aspects of um, physical therapy. Um, I was writing quite a lot during the nine during the late nineteen nineties, um, submitting articles to. In those days, we used to have various um, newsletters. I think they were called McKenzie newsletters. We had, there was uh, a UK one, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, US one. Uh, and my articles used to get passed around quite freely. Um, and so Robin McKenzie got to hear about me or got to read some of my work, uh, liked the way that I wrote and contacted me sometime in the late 1990s and asked his initial request was to see if I could help him um, edit a few chapters for a new book, for a new edition of The Lumber Spine. Uh, that was his initial request. Um, it actually turned out to be writing three new books, became three new books over a period of uh, s seven or eight years, in fact. Um, so we first of all wrote the Extremity book, uh, that was published in 2000. Um, not, this was an application of the McKenzie principles of mechanical diagnosis and therapy to the extremities. 
which was entirely new in those days. Obviously, this is 20 years later and people are much more familiar with that concept, but um, it was very early in those days. So we, so the approach, the way we did it was um, particular to introducing a new co a concept, an old concept, a familiar concept, but to a new area. Um, so it was written in a, a very different way from the second editions of The Lumbar Spine, which was published in 2003, uh, and then the Cervical and Thoracic Spine, which was the second edition again, which was published in 2006, which I was um, very involved in the writing of those um, with Robin McKenzie. Um, I was c continuing then in clinical practice as well as doing the writing, so I was pretty busy then. Uh, lots of late nights and long days working, as you can imagine. Um, and then I was also beginning to publish quite a bit in the scientific literature as well, and the whole process of the v very different writing articles for journals, for scientific journals, compared to writing clinical books. Um, and so my publication list was building. Uh, I wrote lots of different types of um, uh, papers. This included uh, some case studies so we could begin to introduce, for instance, extremity, uh, the use of extremities in mechanical diagnosis and therapy, uh, it, case series, uh, qualitative studies, uh, I was involved in a number of randomized controlled trials and secondary analysis of those. Um, I did quite a lot of cohort studies. Um, I was involved in uh, a number of systematic reviews and have con continued to publish probably more in systematic reviews than anything else, um, particularly in later years. Um, so I was building up that. Um, my publication list now sort of is over a hundred um, articles, chapters in books, and and the books themselves. Um, and at some point, I moved into the university, a local university, uh, so doing less clinical practice and then um, becoming more involved in research and in teaching. Uh, and in supervision of students who are doing masters and uh, PhDs, uh, and my current situation is I'm largely retired now. Um, I do a little bit of supervision, a little bit of writing, generally retired. Uh, so that's sort of me brought up to date. Um, yeah. That's awesome. I was going to ask about your experience writing the books with Mackenzie. I imagine that was very exciting. Yes, it was. It it certainly was. Um, I I, uh, I had quite a free reign in terms of um, the 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 way that we wanted them to be developed. Uh, obviously, when Mackenzie first wrote them, they were they were quite old at this point. The initial those are the those people who remember the original blue books. Um, the first one, the lumbar spine, was published in 1981, and then his cervical and thoracic spine was published in 1990. So they were already they were you know quite a, by 2000 they were you know the first one was obviously 20 years old already. The first lumbar spine was 100 and something pages, and it had. Um, I think, you know, scarcely more than the page of references. And I wanted to make the whole thing much more evidence-based. Uh, and I was also keen to um, uh, ground mechanical diagnosis and therapy in the whole musculoskeletal background and therefore to relate it to the epidemiology, uh, the natural history, the prevalence rates um, associated uh, issues regarding um, the the way that um, we need to understand and to research um, uh, low back pain, for instance, or uh, neck pain, or, or whatever. So, um, so 
So the uh, second edition of those books was much more grounded in, um, as I say, the general musculoskeletal literature, uh, which I thought was very important and told the story of um, uh, of of the patient. Uh, I felt moving from the patient patient in uh, generality to the specific patient in front of you in the assessment process. Uh, how you'd go on then to uh, analyze the assessment and to interpret the assessment findings and to, uh, and to treat and, and to manage them. Um, and, and it was, yes, it was very exciting um, work. This was, we started off doing all this um, almost pre, yeah, it was pre-emails. Um, I think the first time Mackenzie contacted me, um, I had a I had a phone call from somebody in the UK who had contacted Mackenzie who said he wanted to get an email to me and I had to go to a neighbor's house to uh, so it was pre-email we couldn't send documents you know believe it or not um at the early at, uh, early on in this thing we were um we were um, I was sending him things and I seem to remember there were faxes he was making corrections on and sending them back to me if you remember what faxes were they were things that kept, used to come very noisily at clinking out of the machine um, at quite often in the middle of the night, which was rather disturbing to us because it used to wake us up. But, um, anyway, uh, we got it done eventually, but it was, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, um, and it was a, um, um, my immersion in the literature was, um, yeah, was was sort of in, invaluable, really, in in, in doing that. Uh, I'd read so much before, and then for each chapter, I would do a whole lot more. By the end of that period, my whole bookshelves, you can see them now, they're much, uh, lots of paintings, but they're sort of books and things over here. Um, but in the, in the old days, uh, all that was covered with... Um, uh, piles and piles of articles uh, and there was more bookshelves down on this side and they were also covered in um, packets and packets of uh, articles from different um, uh, it, different areas that I'd research in order to uh, to write the book so it was a yeah so, um, and I hope um, people still get a lot from it um, it certainly took a lot from me in the writing of it <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome to hear all of this story. It's so funny that today technology is so different. And in that time, you had to jump through so many hoops to get these things done. So it's it's interesting that it looks so far away, and it's not. It was a couple decades, two decades ago, three decades yes, ago. Yes, exactly. Yes, not that's that. Fine. So, much, so much has changed so quickly, Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Extraordinarily quickly. Yep. Yep. Awesome. And I know you published so many, many art articles. So there are a lot of topics we want to talk about, but I'm going to start with one and let's see how far we go. If you have time, we talk a little bit about other topics as well. But I want to just start talking about centralization and directional preference. So I know you published quite a bit on that topic too. So Let's start maybe by just defining what is centralization and directional preference to the, the ones that are not familiar with the concept. Certainly. Um, so centralization, it defines the, um, it's, a, it's a symptom response, um, which is the abolition, the decrease in abolition, but particularly the abolition of distal referred spinal symptoms in response to repeated movements or postures uh, and and directional preference is the repeated movement that induces that centralization or that abolition or that decrease in symptoms. Um, the key the key that people should understand if they're not familiar with these concepts is that these are therapeutically driven. In other words, it's something that you do to the patient or the patient does for themselves that causes this change in symptoms. Uh, so in other words, you do repeated movements, whether they are 
you know, into extension or into flexion or, or sideways movements, or you do a mobilization, which might be an extension mobilization or whatever. It's a therapeutically driven thing, which induces the abolition of um, distal pain followed by um, the abolition of any remaining spinal symptoms. Uh, and, and the fact that it's therapeutically induced is obviously very important in all this. Um, obviously, during the natural history of spine and referred symptoms, you can get uh, pain that starts off, for instance, in the back, is referred down the leg, and then over time, gradually gets better, the leg pain decreases, and then the spine pain itself goes. And that could happen through natural history. That's not centralization, or what we would have referred to as centralization, because that's not that's just the passage of time. That's just the natural history. Um, whereas what we mean by centralization is that this is something that happens in response to a therapeutic uh, action, um, therapeutic movement. Uh, so it's it, it's a clinical concept that um, Mackenzie kind of stumbled upon, really, um, in the early on in his career, uh, and started writing about it. it. It sort of got written down in 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 his first book, nineteen eighty one. And, and he did publish a brief article in a, in a journal about it. But there wasn't much in the, in the scientific literature uh, until, the 19, until 1990. And then um, more started to get published from 1990 onwards. Uh, to, so that um, we wanted to, uh, to try to summarize some of this literature about centralization because we thought it was an important um clinical tool and so we did various systematic reviews uh they were published in 2004 2012 and 2018 and by the last publication there were over 100 um references that we included that referred to centralization and directional preference uh most the relating to low back pain, but some to neck pain, uh, so neck pain referred. Um, and the, I guess the key things are generally it was associated with good prognosis. This is obviously what Mackenzie stated when he first introduced it. He went, what he found was that once you got people doing the thing that caused the centralization, Actually, people went on to have a um, a good outcome, and the literature showed that on the whole, uh, that was so. Uh, there were one or two articles that didn't um, it prove that, uh, but generally, the uh, the literature showed that the um, centralization was associated with a range of good outcomes, better function, um, better. Uh, return to work, better reduced sickness, um, uh, reduced sick leave, and, and so on. So a, a whole range of things. Um, so the prognosis was good with centralization. Um, and also the high prevalence rate. So although this varied, obviously, between studies, depending on who was involved in that kind of thing, uh, on the whole, it looked like centralization and directional pr preference included something like 60 to 70 percent of people with um, spinal symptoms, so back pain uh, and neck pain. Um, some studies would, s some of the reviews suggested there was a higher rate of centralization in acute rather than chronic, but even in chronics there could still be 40% of patients who centralize. So in other words, this is a big chunk of, of patients. Um, and other reviews, so besides the three reviews that I was involved with, with co-authors, obviously, in all those instances, uh, Sandra Ione from Italy, um, Helen Clare from Australia helped in the first one, um, Sandra in the in all three actually, and uh, Nils Run uh, in in the last one. 
Um, the um, in terms of the prognosis, this was both back pain and neck pain appeared to suggest better better outcomes with the centralizers compared to the non centralizers, and also in patients who had sciatica. Um, so ridiculous symptoms again demonstrated centralizations again appeared to do better. Did what did do better? Uh, reduced uh, far less incidence of coming to surgery, um, for instance. Um, and the other thing uh, was that non-centralization was obviously therefore associated with a poorer prognosis and also non-centralization was more associated with some of the psychological yellow flags that were highlighted a lot in the, in the 2000s area onwards uh, about being issues that um, could retard um, people's uh, recovery. Um, so, so that was that was key, and and the other the other thing that um, other reviews did, um, not necessarily mine, but other ones looked at prognostic factors in general, like Hart in Hart Vixen in two thousand fifteen, I think he was looked at prognostic variables. And on the whole, um, what these other reviews showed that there was very little besides centralization in the literature as a whole that offered such a good, identifiable, good prognostic variable. Um, so it, it's almost like, you know, why wouldn't you use it? This is a bit of a, it's a no-brainer not to use something as good as this. Um, it's it's there in a, a lot of people. Obviously, the, the the exact prevalence is going to vary, but uh, whether it's acute or chronic or whatever, but certainly more than half, maybe three, nearly three quarters of your patients. And if you find it with whatever you're doing or whatever the patient is doing to themselves, uh, then the likely outcome, if you continue on down that road, is going to be good. Um, and it's very difficult to find anything else to say that uh, that looks that good. Um, so that that seemed to be yes, uh, um, a very interesting finding to come out of, of the reviews that I did. Yep, that was a lot. Um, a lot of my questions you answers probably just with this brief summary. But so let's clarify. So we can use centralization as a prognostic sign, correct? Yes. Yes. And as a management strategy as well? Yes, exactly. So uh, so once you identify something that causes um, the abolition of distal symptoms, um, usually the usually it's going to be a decrease and then the abolition of symptoms. But in terms of research, you've got to have nice, clear-cut um, uh, definitions that can be easily used in a research setting. So it tends to be the abolition of central pain. The directional preference is a little bit more fuzzy around the edges, and so it can include a decrease and then the abolition of um, uh, of of referred symptoms and an increase in range of movement. That's why directional preference is a bit, um, a bit harder to, a bit harder to um, research in in such a clear cut way. Um, but um, yes, that once you see that happening, once you find something, that is your management strategy, and it's very likely that that patient will do well. Um, um, than a patient that you don't find that in. Uh, and the patient that you don't find that in, then maybe you might be needing to explore um, more psychological um, issues um, or barriers. Um, so, so yes. And can we reliably detect centralization and what does the evidence says about it? Well, this is interesting. Um, the the literature tends to be a bit variable on this. When we first started looking at it, um, there were reports of um, some 
uh, very high levels of reliability. Reliability is, um, you, you can look at it through percentage agreement. The trouble with, so in other words, if you have a certain number of at what percentage do they agree? Do they come to the same decision? So you could say it's you know ninety percent agreement, or could obviously be quite good. But the problem with that is that um, uh, there will be agreement by chance anyway. Uh, and so a statistic, or one of the statistics that can be used, yeah, which is called the Kappa statistics, um, uh, um, is a way of looking at that. Um, that goes beyond chance is the idea. Uh, the nearer to one you have, so a, a kappa statistic goes from minus to one, with one being perfect. Um, and um, early on, the literature sort of showed some variability, but quite a lot of um, uh, high statistics, sort of 0 0.7, 0 0.8 to one, which is which is a good level. More recently. The reliability, a particularly very large study that was done by what Wernicke and I can't remember the um, year that that was published, but um, showed the actual um, uh, uh, level of reliability was was quite um, weak, uh, and it didn't. What was interesting about that was that the level of education within the McKenzie um, uh, education program didn't seem to make any difference, which you would expect it to have done. Um, so there is um, some variability. If, if you look at, in terms of the reliability literature overall, then interpreting uh, patient reports has consistently been more reliable than therapists' um, Therapist reports of, say, for instance, a movement impairment or uh, PIVMs or accessory movements, those kind of things, did have very, very low re levels of reliability of agreement between therapists. Whereas anything that is based on a patient report, the levels of reliability for that tend to be much greater. Um, but overall centralization is, as I say, um, it, it, it's, it's not consistent um, the, uh, across studies. So we can't definitely say centralization is fantastically reliable um, from, from the totality of, of, the, of the literature. And um, how about the low back pain uh, practice guideline that was published in 2012 that mentioned centralization and directional preference uh, recommendations based on strong evidence, right? Um, that was something that I wanted to mention because we had a, a McKinsey webinar recently that mentioned that, and that caught my attention because that was something that I did not know that was recommended with such strong evidence. So they, they, they say that clinicians should concede, consider utilize utilizing these movements and exercises to promote centralization, right? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of the guidelines that you're specifically referring to, but, but I, know, yes, I know that there are. The, the, um, what, one thing you need to be aware of with guidelines is that they will be, they are based on um, the literature that is reviewed, obviously enough, um, and Typically, um, they will review systematic reviews, uh, and typically they will include within the what what they will be reviewing in systematic reviews or systematic reviews of randomised controlled trials. So they are a particular form of literature um, that typically is being um, used to construct guidelines which won't necessarily um, in talk about centralization. So centralization is not, not often uh, referred to in randomized controlled trials. It tends to be more cohort studies, though studies in which uh, um, a, a group of people are recruited 
and then followed up over time. And the people who centralize on day one are compared to the non-centralized um, a few months or a year later. So it tends to be more of a cohort study than a randomized controlled trial. Um, and if guideline developers only use systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, which is what on the whole they do, they won't particularly be considering centralization uh, because those are the cohort studies. So that's something that needs to be borne in mind. So not all guidelines will refer to it. That's my point. I know some guidelines do, but... Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't know about this one specifically. Um, so you need to, you need to uh, look at, uh, in their summary, you need to look at the methodology that they've used terms of where they got the lich that's, but... that's an interest interesting point so it could potentially not make as much to clinical guidelines because they are they don't have as many systematic reviews is that right or... it, it depends what they're including so quite often guidelines will be looking at randomized controlled trials uh -huh. But randomized controlled trials are so typically, you know, between two interventions because uh -huh. guidelines tend to focus on it and be very intervention based. Uh -huh. Centralization is, it is not particularly related to an intervention. We, we relate it to repeated movements. Um, and obviously that's how we would induce it. Um, but that's not a particularly, that's not really an intervention as in um, uh, a, um, I don't know, uh, McKenzie versus stabilization exercises, for instance. Um, it's asking a slightly different question. Um, uh, and and so on the whole, it's, it, as I say, it's cohort studies that have been used to study centralization, not randomized controlled trials but it's randomized controlled trials that will be used to um, talk about guidelines, systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, if that makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. I'm just going to tell people that are listening to us, if they want to go look it up, I'll tell you the title so they can go look it up. Is Low Back Pain Clinical Practice Guidelines Linked to the International Classification of Functioning? Disability and Health from the Orthopedic Section of the American Physiotherapy Association. And that was published on JOSP, JOSPT at 2012. So if people, now I'll look it up later, now I'm curious to see, but if people want to go check, they can check um, the recommendations for the centralization and directional preference exercise and procedures. Okay, very interesting. Um, and I was going to ask, you already mentioned a little bit about the, the predictors of outcome that we don't have many. And I saw that you research a little bit about fear avoidance as well, comparing uh, centralization and fear avoidance, right? Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we didn't actually, we, we looked at the literature in which um, centralization or directional preference and psychosocial issues were collected as well. Um, so these would be pr prospective studies, again, not necessarily RCTs, not necessarily randomized control studies, but looking at the different prognostic value of baseline factors. So for instance, a lot of the work um, that um, a lot of the very sophisticated work around centralization was do done by Mark Wernicke and his research group and, and all those are cohort studies uh, in which he um, uh, collected the data and then followed patients through and looked at baseline variables, the predicted outcomes. So, collected the, the so, so what predicted? So, at baseline, if there were centralizers and various um, sick leave factors, various psychosocial factors, 
and see saw which of those best predicted outcomes say at one year. And uh, in um, in a couple of his studies, he showed that centralization was a bigger predictor of outcome um, than uh, the psychosocial factors that he had collected. Uh, and there were other s similar findings from other papers that when um, the centralization or directional preference and uh, psychosocial factors were collected, um, then quite often, not always, but quite often, the uh, the directional preference or the centralization could be a big, bigger predictor of um, uh, bigger, yeah, better predictor of outcomes um, than the psychosocial factors. And equally, non-centralization um, should raise clinicians um, sort of awareness that psychosocial factors might be being a more of a problem uh, more of a a, um, a a barrier to to recovery awesome and um, um, another thing that I wanted to ask about is the difference the, of centralization between acute and then subacute and chronic back pain. So, I, if I remember correctly, you mentioned that the 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 prevalence was higher in acute back pain. Is that right? And then a little bit lower in subacute and low back pain in general. Yes. Um, I mean, we we looked at that in. Um, in quite a lot of detail in our um, in our review in 2018 um, and um, where we summarized previous literature and then we also brought it up to date so summarizing literature from um, 2012 obviously literature can change over time but um, um, initially it had been um, very um, Uh, yes, it, it, that um, it, it had seemed that a, acute low back pain was much more likely to uh, have centralization, um, and that had been sort of um, 77 77% 77 in the subacute population, 50% in the acute subacute, uh, and then down to 40 42% in the in the mix for the chronic population. There has seemed to be a um, uh, a range around centralization um but that became it became less marked uh in some of the more recent literature uh but there still there still tended to be uh some um uh, the, the with the more acute patients more likely to be demonstrating um, centralization or directional preference. Um, having said that, it's still important to recognize that um, uh, there was still, e even in the chronic population, there was still a large group, a large proportion who were demonstrating centralization. Um, and so it would still be worthwhile exploring. Uh, obviously, within the chronic population, you're more likely to have um, other uh, other factors which might um, make a, a, a straightforward uh, response um, more complicated and less likely. Um, but certainly not um, uh, worthwhile not ignoring uh, the possibility that centralization could be found. Uh, the the numbers are still pretty high, even on the the yes, chronic. Yes, numbers are still pretty high. Yeah. But and, yeah. and again, back to that point, they, if if there is a failure to find centralization, then you might have to take uh, account of other factors, including the sort of psychosocial factors, uh, and give them more um, more import. Um, but you can't find non centralization unless you've looked for centralization. If you yeah. see what I'm, yes, yeah, <laughs> um, you, you should um, always screen for that first. Exactly, you should screen. So, I mean, 
Uh, yes, I mean, I would say that it's the obvious for any, any clinician who gets presented, you know, back, back to that point, really, if you have something that is as highly prevalent as this, um, even in the chronic population, um, and has the potential for such a good prognosis, and can guide your management strategies, you would be foolish to ignore it. Um, if it, if you don't find it, um, then you may well be want to be exploring other things. But unless you look for it, you you won't find it. Um, so, so, so it's it, it it should be the first line of any clinicians attempt to try to find the management strategy that the patient can use to themselves get better. Um, and not always on the, on the first attempt. That's the other thing that Mark Wernicke's studies show that, um, um, within, within the, obviously within the centralizers day one, most of those will stay centralizers um, by day four or five. Um, in the non-centralizers day one, a proportion, and I don't remember the exact proportion, but I think it was nearly a half something, of the non-centralizers day one will become centralizers by day four or five. So again, um, it, it it's worth, if there is the hint there, and obviously is a clinical um, thing, clinical clues within the assessment process that, that might lead you to think, oh, this sounds like, or this looks like you could have a directional preference. And experienced clinicians will know those kind of things from taking the history, patient reports, what makes them better, what makes them worse. Um, they do certain movements and their movement that their, their flexibility goes, you know, gets worse or the flexibility gets better. Um, and then some clues within the physical examination and you think, oh, this person looks like, sounds like they should have a directional preference. They not displaying it now on day one on the first assessment. Well, let's test them out over a couple of days. Uh, and that from the literature is definitely, uh, worthwhile doing, um, uh, give it a few days, send them away, testing out a, um, uh, a, a directional preference strategy, obviously, with warnings about worsening peripheralization and so on and so forth. Oh, yes, we haven't, I've just touched on it there. We haven't really talked about peripheralization, um, but just for to fill that in um, for those who are not familiar. So that describes the opposite of centralization. So, in other words, in response to repeated movement, in response to positioning, um, the symptoms are pushed further down the limb, down the arm, down the leg. Um, and we would see that as a worsening of symptoms. Um, and, uh, that would be a, uh, a, 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 a red light to stop that movement, um, and to explore other movement, uh, other movement directions. Uh, not all movement, obviously, but, uh, not that particular movement, which is inducing that term um, peripheralization. Uh, we haven't particularly talked about the, in terms of the direction of preference, the literature shows that extension is, does appear to be, uh, the, the movement which is most likely to induce centralization or directional preference from quite a number of studies that shows that, but uh, certainly not the only one. Uh, and so as a good clinician, you've got to be aware, of, even if you're starting off with extension, that some people are going to be worse, made worse, peripheralize with extension. And so Flexion obviously needs to be explored and lateral movements need to be explored as well. And there is a good chunk of, um, um, variably, but you know, uh, 10%, five, 10 ish percent, 10% who will respond, who will be flexion responders. 
uh, and then 15, 20%, 25%, something around there, who who will respond to lateral forces. So side gliding or rotation mobilizations, those kind of different things. Uh, and again, that is uh, that does come across clearly in the literature. Um, extension is most commonly the the directional preference movement, but certainly not the only one. Um, and again, it's important to pick up on those points clearly. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people just think McKenzie's extension, and that's how I learned in college. McKenzie was extension. So I think it's very important to talk about that so people don't think that McKenzie is the is the same as extension. Yes, absolutely not. Um, yes, no, it, is it the um, that has for some reason got the McKenzie approach has this reputation for some reason as just doing extension exercises. It's certainly not that. Um, I would suggest it's a, it's an assessment and management process um, in which you're testing out various movements and postures and positions uh, which are going to be used in the assessment process and then in the management process. So there's a very nice sequential logical um, uh, sweep, if you like, from the assessment process into the management process uh, and quite often because of the commonality of using uh, extension exercises, extension will be used first uh, and often primarily uh, and often most commonly, but certainly not only. And if you just bang away with extension, you will make some people worse. Um, and that's, yeah, that's an important point to bear in mind. Yeah. And I know that we talked a lot about uh, low back pain and most research are about low back pain. Do you feel like that translates the same to the neck or do you feel like there is any difference overall? No, uh, the um, literature is dominated by um, things that re relate to low back pain. But um, there is some um, there is some work that has been done on looking at uh, neck pain as well, and um, uh, much smaller numbers. But it would suggest that there are similar uh, similar occurrences of centralization. Again, sixty to seventy percent of people uh, with neck pain demonstrate um, uh, centralization and directional preference. Um, with with neck pain, so I think it it is similar, but it it it's far less well documented. Uh, yeah, w which is you could say, well, that's you know pretty well true of everything about neck pain. Um, it's much less well. It it it's all of it is entirely less well documented. There's much more written about low back pain, um, and there is about neck pain. Uh, okay, good. Um, before we transition to our final questions, is there any other consideration um, about centralization, directional preference, anything that you want to mention before we wrap up? No, I, I don't think so. I, um, I, I'd just like to emphasize that uniqueness, really, as a clinical tool. Uh, I don't think there's anything like it um, in terms of um, it, its commonality that we've talked about, its high prevalence rate, uh, its potential to indicate a good prognosis, and its potential to indicate a management strategy. Uh, and as I say, if, if a clinician don't take, doesn't take such a, um, such a gift into account, they would seem to be shooting themselves in the foot in a very uh, daft way, really. Um, and obviously there are going to be times when um, the clinical uh, assessment process is going to be more complicated and, in, and, and require um, more uh, um, 
uh, other other directions, if you like. Um, but unless you examine for it, you won't find it. I think that's a, that's a key point. And and we don't really, have, as I say, within the literature, nothing else has come up, despite its, you, you know, as, as we talked about some of the weaknesses and some of the contradictions within the literature, nothing else has come up as consistently uh, useful uh, as that um, over years and years and years. So, um, uh, 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 yeah, I think due weight must be given to it and its value clinical value. Absolutely. That's why we are talking about it. So people, more PTs are all, can be aware of the these two and can uh, benefit from it and, and research and learn and, and, and be aware of this. Um, okay. So Stephen, let's talk about a resource of information. So that's going to be a tough one. Papers, articles you recommend if people want to learn more about that. Um, what would you recommend? Um, well, obviously, um, if, if you're interested in any topic, uh, the best source of information about that topic are systematic reviews. Systematic reviews are not just reviews for those of you who are not familiar with them. They are um, scientific works of in their own. Um, they are conducted in a, um, uh, a rigorous and as comprehensive a as manner as possible. Um, nowadays, they will come with health warnings about the quality of the literature that is found. Um, so they are a very good start point for any source of information about whatever it is that you are, are wanting uh, to have a look at, to investigate. Systematic reviews used to be uh, the sole providence of randomized controlled trials and so specific intervention. Um, over the years, um, systematic, the systematic review science has been applied to a range of different things. Um, and we started off um, looking at centralization uh, as a systematic review um now uh, and there are i don't know if yeah i'm sure you'll be able to find these but there's a um, the first one was published in 2004 uh and then 2012 and then 2018 was our last publication which was in musculoskeletal science and practice so that's 2018 38 uh, 53 to 62 pages. Um, so that is a starting point. If you want to find out more about centralization, that should refer to the other things. Um, I was going to talk about, uh, so, so that's, a, that's a systematic review. Oh, yes. So, so in terms of the science of writing a systematic review, because of the number of different types of study um, that we had to include for that, um, we couldn't do a meta-analysis on it apart from things like the prevalence rates, um, that kind of thing. So a meta-analysis is basically the same as the systematic review, but whereas in a systematic review you do a narrative summary, in other words, in words, you make you draw some sort of conclusions, in a meta-analysis you try and do that with figures. But to do that, obviously there are certain... Um, certain conditions that need to be upheld in the literature that you're trying to draw together. Um, and that's to do with the fact that you've got figures that you can, you can, um, you, you can sort of put together in, in the same box. So in other words, you can't, you can't, put, you can't lump apples and oranges together and come up with, um, you know, uh, so you, so you've got to have the right literature there, but systematic reviews and meta analysis are a good, very good start point. Um, and, so, so for instance, we've done systematic reviews around reliability studies, um, around other people have done systematic reviews on prognostic studies. So there's a whole huge literature now on uh, systematic reviews. This is not just about uh, randomized controlled trials. 
So that's just that's your start point, really. I would say, um, and I, on any literature topic that you're interested in, um, that was what you were asking, really, wasn't it? About um, if, if, yeah, if if people are interested in research, research concepts, um, and they want to it depends. I mean, you can get more and more complicated, really. Uh, research and research concepts. Um, the um, uh, my friend and colleague Chris Littlewood and myself wrote a book about uh, research in physiotherapy, um, which is a good introduction to different study designs and how it relates to uh, to physiotherapy, um, and very good introduction to um, things like statistics and um, epidemiology are provided by the couple of books by by uh called the pdq and they're by a couple of authors called norman and Streiner, uh and they're quite they're quite thin but they're quite quite palatable manageable and they're very good instructions those things but i mean once you start reading uh research stuff it you can go on endlessly, really, but um, but if, in terms of clinical stuff, then certainly um, systematic reviews are the start point. Yeah, I'm glad we have people that really like research. <laughs> it sounds complicated. <laughs> um, and Stephen, what would be the best advice you give give to clinicians that are starting their careers? I would say for a musculoskeletal physiotherapist, what you need is a logical, structured, and standardized assessment process um, that allows you to glean as much information as possible from the patient, who is probably the person who knows their symptoms the best. Uh, see if they give you clues as to what can help them manage that problem. Um, and then don't get too bogged down by doing too many things, which will just completely um, cloud your understanding. Um, so keep it simple and keep it straightforward. Um, I, I think the McKenzie assessment process is a great tool for that. Uh, by all means, build on it um, if you need to become more complicated, but you need to start simple and then you need to build. Um, I think as a, um, as a junior physiotherapist, you tend to be overwhelmed by so many different um, ways of doing things and input from all sorts of different angles and most people, most um, junior physiotherapists, I think, physical therapists, um, get swamped uh, and uh, lose themselves in, uh, get totally confused. Um, so the most, the, the most logical and sequential uh, approach that you can take, I think, is the most helpful. Uh, and obviously read as widely as you can, um, I would say, <laughs> and, and, and do a, um, a, an MSc in research methodology, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. And I think it's important that you mention having a structure because sometimes you're all over the place and having something to follow and having a structure is really good, especially when you're going out of college and you got so many and you are not organized on your you don't have your thoughts and process organized on like how do you do things so i think that's very helpful and uh, yes and link the link the the history to the physical pro physical examination and then link the physical examination to the management yeah absolutely quite often i remember seeing students and they they did take the history and then it's like they put that in the drawer and they ignore it. And then they do the physical examination and then they put that somewhere else and then they go on to management. And they, none of these things seem to relate to each other. You just think, well, 
why did you take the history? Why did you do the physical? You know, um, so I, I, yeah, I think it's very easy to get confused as a as, as a starting physical therapist, and you need to uh, yeah, the more logical, the more structured, uh, sequential, as I say, um, uh, the better, and relating your relating your history through to your physical examination through to your management strategy. Yep. Connecting the dots. Connecting the dots, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. And you you can't become complicated unless you've got the basics under under your belt. Um and, and you need to have that. Uh and we've talked about, you know, what you need to be looking for, I think, or, or a key thing uh, it, it, there about looking for centralization, but um, um, listening to the patient. There are many clues from the patient. So I think you're answering my next question that what personal qualities and abilities are important to become a successful PT? So listening to the patient, you already mentioned one. Absolutely. And I think listening to the patient is key. Um, you have to have the ability to ask the right questions. So um, it, yes, asking the right questions, uh, listening to what the, the patient has to say, maybe asking it in a slightly different way, uh, summarizing back to the patient. So do I understand you correctly? Um, if, if that's a personal, yeah, I think that's a personal characteristic, really. Um, the patient will probably has the best understanding. They live with their problem. They will be the source of the information, but they don't necessarily know what bits of it you want. Um, and so it should be a um, combined therapeutic approach between you and the patient. Um they're good interpersonal skills, obviously. I I would say that you have to have a good understanding of research. Um, particular, yeah, um, and a, a good re, a, a good ability to li read the literature, and that does mean you've got to have some understanding of that literature uh, and what's good literature and what's bad literature. Um, and I know we've been talking a lot about. McKenzie and all that, and centralization. But I think one has to be aware of being blinkered by one approach or another, by by being taken in by gurus. Um, there's a lot of that within physical therapy. Uh, and I think we have to let the literature speak for itself. Um, there are a lot of people who make money out of running courses and people, physiotherapists, physical therapists get very um, uh, drawn into, sucked into some uh, particular approaches uh, from these very uh, charismatic um, guru type um, leaders within physical therapy. And I think we have to be a little bit cautious of that. That's certainly been going on for decades. And uh, I think it, yeah, have to be aware. Um, Look at the literature uh, and see where the literature is, uh, is 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 taking us. I think is important. So it's back to that. You need to be able to understand. Um, yeah. So back to back to research and understanding research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you are so you are aware of what's going on and don't get lost with all these new trends and new things that people are uh, talking about all over the place. And Dr. Steven, if people want to learn more about you or your work, how they can find you? Um, how can they find me? Um, well, I have retired now, really. Um, um, my work, I'm sure if you... Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure I can answer that. <laughs> um, my work is in the literature. Um, if they type her name, they're going to come up with a list. I think it was ResearchGate or something that they have like 
a lot of pretty much all the papers, I guess, that people can find related to your name, right? Yeah, I think uh, there's still an active website from my last employment, which is at Sheffield Hallam University. It seems to be the most, um, and that seems to be uh, listing some of my more recent um, uh, articles since uh, that I've written since um, since retiring. Okay. Okay, I can put some of those links there, the 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 papers we talked about, and um, some link that can connect to your research. If people want to learn about more about what we talked and look for papers, they can start there. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for taking the time, accepting my invitation, and gives us this research overview about centralization, directional preference, and bring all this information. I really appreciate you taking the time to to be here and talking to us. Uh, that's been a pleasure, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I hope um, I hope it's been useful. Uh, absolutely, a hundred percent. Thank you. <laughs>